So, Father, we thank you for this time together with your people. Thank you, Father, for this time in your word. Lord Jesus, I would just ask you to please direct us in our study that this would be profitable, Lord, for each one of us, no matter where we are on our journey of understanding, that you would plant more seed in our hearts concerning your eternal word. I ask it in your name, in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Well, let's just read in review for just a moment. Go back to Romans 5. Let's read 17 through 21. We finished Romans 5 a couple of weeks ago. So Romans 5, 17. And I'm ringing up here. Can you hear it? Romans 5, beginning in verse 17. It says, For if by the transgression of the one, speaking of Adam, death reigned, through the one much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Here we've got the first Adam and Jesus being the last Adam. Look at the next verse. <clears throat> So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, that's Adam's fall, even so, through one act of righteousness, there's the cross, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made, read that word, righteous. Wow. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So look at your notes. We're going to review for about five minutes here. Jesus, the last Adam, that's how he's referred to in, in the scripture, perfectly fulfilled the law in his life on earth in the place of those that he would redeem. This is called his act of obedience, where he would totally and perfectly fulfill the law. Here's perfect righteousness that he gives to us. If you're born again, the righteousness that Jesus gives you is the righteousness that he earned in his life on earth. Martin Luther called this an alien righteousness because we didn't do it, he did it, but he gives it to us. Then back on your notes. Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary, so we've talked about his life, and we're going to talk about his death. His sacrifice at Calvary perfectly met God's requirements for the removal of our sin. Luther would call this his passive obedience. In other words, he gave his life. They didn't take it. Our sin was put on Christ. He bore God's wrath in our place. Remember at the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was God turning his back on Christ as Jesus bore our sin. And as believers in Christ today, our sin is taken from us as far as the east is from the west, never again to be upon us. I tell you what, I think that's awesome what God has done. And now we are clothed in Jesus' perfect righteousness. Luther called it an alien righteousness, and whatever you want to call it, our sin is gone, and we can stand in God's presence with security. In fact, look at Romans 5, 1 and 2. Speaking of security, look at chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that means having been saved or made righteous, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, And we exult in hope of the glory of God. How many are looking forward to the glory of God on that day? Oh, my goodness. So grace is reigning in our lives as we see in verse 21 of chapter 5. Look at verse 21 down to the end of the chapter. It says, so that as sin reigned in death, that's what happened through Adam's fall, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, that was Romans 5, which we just finished. Now, in chapter 6, We're going to continue to see God's grace and His great love in our salvation. So look at chapter 6. You're right there. And we'll read our text, verses 1 through 14. So let's read it through one time. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then in light of what we just read in chapter 5? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. In other words, now we're good trees bearing good fruit. Verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. Notice that, no longer slaves of sin. 
For he who has died is freed from sin. Everybody say, I died with Christ and I'm free from sin. You still fail from time to time, obviously, but sin is not your master. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's read that verse one more time, verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Everybody say amen. So look at your notes right there after the, after the text. Let's read that first paragraph. One fundamental truth of Romans 6 is not that the Christian no longer fights sin, but that the power of sin has been broken in the life of every believer. In other words, as God's children, now we still fall short, but our lives are not characterized by sin. If your life is character, characterized by sin, we need to sit and talk. Every Christian battles sin, but that does not characterize who we are. In other words, we died to sin we're alive in Christ, Romans 6, 11. It says, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. But every single believer on earth today is still fighting this battle against temptation and sin. This is called the flesh. John Owen, he died in 1683. He was a Puritan. He was an Englishman. This is what he wrote. The choicest believers who are assuredly freed from the condemning power of sin ought yet to make it their business all their days to mortify the indwelling power of sin. The word mortify means to subdue or kill it. Let me read it one more time. The choicest believers, I hope that's us in this room tonight, who are assuredly freed from the condemning power of sin, ought yet to make it their business all their days to mortify the indwelling power of sin. Put your hand on your heart and say, help me, Lord, to keep killing my sin. That's an ongoing battle that we fight day to day. So look on your notes, dead to sin and alive to God. Let me read verses 1 and 2 one more time. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So look at your notes there. Dead to sin and alive with Christ is Paul's focus in our text in this passage in chapter 6. What does it mean to be dead to sin? Well, I got two points here. We are now in Christ if we are born again. Everybody say, that's me. If you're born again, you are in Christ, and that makes the question of verse 1 just incomprehensible. Here's the question in verse 1. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Of course not. So look at the next bullet point. The tense of the verb died in verse 2. How shall we who died to sin? The tense there is aorist, which means... It refers to a single action that has taken place, and here is when we were born again. When you were born again, as far as God was concerned and as far as you're concerned, that was when you died to sin. Your life has been, then your residence has been changed to heaven. Yes, you're still in the flesh. Yes, you still have to battle against the flesh. But how many know your home is with the Lord? I can't wait till we get our new bodies. Everybody say amen. In other words, every single believer fights this battle against temptation and the flesh. John Owen, he said it, we already read that. So look, to, look at, where are we? Dead to sin and alive to God. Let's read what's there. Dead to sin and alive with Christ is Paul's focus in our text. And what does it mean to be dead to sin? Here we go. We are now in Christ if we are born again, which as, as I mentioned already, I'm repeating myself, made the point of verse one unquestionable. The tense of the verb died in verse two is aorus, as I mentioned. So here's a wrong interpretation on your notes. Number one. The Christian is no longer tempted by sin. Do you know any Christian that's no longer tempted by sin? Has there ever been a day in your life when you were never tempted by sin? Some of you may say yes, but I think if you look really close, you know, at least you were tempted to be mad at somebody who said something ugly to you. So can a dead man be tempted? It refers to the verse 2, having died to sin. That's where they get that view, but look at the letter A there. This view gets the tense of died correct, but the problem is that there is not one person like this. 
And verses 11 through 14 make the point clear. So let's skip down to verse 11. I'm sorry I lost my place there. Verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now read verse 14 with me out loud. Here we go. For sin shall not be master over you. <clears throat> that makes the point pretty clear, does it not? Sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. On your notes. <clears throat> the truth is that each one of us fights this battle every day, but the fact that we fight this good fight evidences our salvation. So the result of having died to sin when we were born again is that we can be victorious now in this daily fight for sanctification. That's the pursuit of holiness. So on your notes, in verse 2, the words dead to sin is not something we do, but what has been done for us when we were joined to Christ. The power of sin is broken for every believer. Everybody say amen. It's true for every one of us, even though we still fight the good fight. And we do. So thank God glorification is coming. That's when we get new bodies and there'll be no more temptation. Until then, church, let's consider ourselves to be dead to sin. Everybody say amen. Look down at verses 10 and 11 now. Our battle with indwelling sin. Chapter 6, 10 and 11. It says, For the death that he died, speaking of Jesus, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves, Christian, to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now look on your notes, our battle with indwelling sin. Jesus died to sin once for all, as we read in verse 10. Jesus' work of salvation is finished. From the cross, what did he say? It is finished. And that was when the work of salvation was done. As a result of our union with Jesus, the old life of sin in Adam is passed for us. That's not the life we have now. We've been born again. We're new creatures. So keep reading. We've been given new life in Christ, and we are clothed with His righteousness. New creatures, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says that if, if, what does it say? I can't read my own writing. It's like my glasses are no good. Everybody say, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus because I'm born again. You can read it later, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And what's the result of this? The result of this, our hearts now, even though our flesh is still fighting us, our hearts pursue after righteousness, and we hate it when we sin. I do, and so do you. Galatians 2.20, one verse here. Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. That's true for every one of us that are believers. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Then on your notes, Romans 6, 11, here's our battle, another aspect of it. Consider yourselves to be what? The rest of that verse says, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we're considering ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. In other words, everything that God has for us in our salvation has come to us in Christ Jesus. So what's our job? Our job is to keep our eyes on Jesus and to keep walking in the light. Amen. Keep reading. Bottom line. If you are born again, you cannot go back. You have died to sin and are now alive to God. I backslid. You didn't lose your salvation if you were genuinely born again. You cannot lose it. Yes, you can wander. Yes, we see all these examples in Scripture of God, you know, Jonah and all these other guys. There may be a whale waiting for you too. I don't know. <laughs> but I know this, that when God saves you, nothing can take you from that place. Everybody say amen to that. So here's Augustine on your notes here. He died in 430 A.D. Command what you will, he says of God, and give what you command. And so it is to us today as God's children. So here's John Stott. He died in 2011. This is what he wrote. It's a long quote here, but this is what he said. Suppose there is a man called John Jones, an elderly Christian who is looking back on his long life. His life is divided into two parts, like all of our lives. <laughs> John Jones before and John Jones after conversion. The old self and the new self are not John Jones's two natures. They are the two halves of his life, separated by the new birth. At conversion, signified in baptism, the baptism represents baptized into Christ and then raised to new life. 
Signified in baptism, John Jones, the old self, died through union with Christ, the penalty of his sin born. At the same time, coming up out of the water, John Jones rose from death a new man to live a new life to God. Now keep reading. John Jones is every believer. The way in which our old self died is that we were crucified with Christ. The old man was me before my salvation. Volume 2 is the story of the new man. After I was made a new creation in Christ, I was a sinner. I deserved to die. I did die. I received what I deserved in my substitute with whom I have become one. Aren't you glad that Jesus bore your penalty? Then he goes on. Volume 2 of my biography opened with my resurrection, my old life having finished, a new life to God has begun. I tell you what, this salvation is an amazing thing. The more we understand it and look at it, the greater it gets, at least in my heart. On your notes, look at the next paragraph. Here's St. Augustine. He died in 430. He said that before Adam fell, he was, here's Latin words, posse pecari. He was able to sin. Adam had not sinned, yet he was able to, obviously. After his fall, Augustine said that Adam became non posse, non pecari, which means not able to not sin. In other words, now his nature was fallen. By himself, Adam, he was unable to break free from sin's power. Now keep reading. The state of those justified by Christ's work is posse non pecari. Augustine, once again, writing in Latin, which means able not to sin. Everybody say, that's me. That's every true Christian. You're able to walk in holiness even though we still battle the flesh. Keep reading. This is what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 6. For the believer, the tyranny of sin has been broken. We can sin, but we are able, read it out loud, and that's the battle that every one of us fight every day. Keep reading. In other words, the Christian has been set free from sin's bondage. That's true. We now have ability to cooperate with God's grace. If a Christian has sin reigning in their life, listen, it's because they allow it. Everybody say, sin is not my master. Temptation comes, but sin is not your master. Jesus is your Lord, not sin. So back on your notes, that last little bullet point there. Thank God the day of glorification is coming. How many are looking forward to that day? That's when we get new bodies, no more temptation, no more flesh like we have in this nature. I tell you what, glorification is going to be a great day. No more temptation and 100% holiness in God's presence. Oof, even so, come Lord Jesus. Everybody say Maranatha. So look at that next point there on your notes. Where do we go from here? There's only one choice for those who have been made alive in Christ. There is no going back. Amen to that. We fight sin every day, every one of us, but it does not typify our lives. Here's 1 John 3, 9. Look at this one verse. No one who is born of God practices. In other words, you can't live in sin if you're born of God because his seed, God's seed, abides in him and he cannot sin as far as abiding in sin because he is born of God. Yes, we fight sin, but sin does not characterize our life. If sin characterizes our lives, we're probably not born again. We may be religious, but we may not truly be saved. So John Owen, look at once again, here's what he said. Do you mortify sin? Do you kill sin? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day, for in this work be killing your sin, or it will be killing you. That's a great quote right there. And that's true for every one of us. Every day we're battling to walk in what's right and to battle against what is wrong. So back on your notes. What tools has God given me for this battle with sin? I've got three obvious ones on our notes. Here's one, persist in prayer. How many battle to do that every day? I do. Every day I try to find time to carve out time for prayer in the morning and in the evening. And of course, most of us are praying all through the day as we drive down the road and whatever happens, we're obviously in a prayer attitude. But to be in a prayer closet, in a place where you're in quiet, you're not being disrupted, I tell you, that's a great thing to increase your strength on the inside. Everybody say amen. Persist in prayer. Keep on in the scripture. Are you reading your Bible every day? That's another key to being strong in faith and walking in righteousness. And then, not to, and to be faithful, to not forsake the assembling of yourselves, as we see in Hebrews 10, 25. And so you're here at church, so God bless you for that. John MacArthur, this is what he says about this. A saving relationship with God is inextricably linked to holy living. And a holy life is lived by the power of God working in and through the heart 
of the true believer. How many good trees bear good fruit? Every cotton picking one. So in other words, every genuine Christian has evidence that they're born again. Yes, we battle against sin, but the evidence is there in one way or another every day and every night. And then go back in your text and look at verse 2 of chapter 6. It says, Must we, may we continue in sin so the grace may increase. May it never be, look at this now, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Skip down to verse 10. Look at verse 10 of chapter 6. For the death that he died, Jesus, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God, verse 11, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So read on your notes here, notice dead to sin. Let's read right there. How did Jesus die to sin? Now listen very carefully here. Notice verse 10 does not say Jesus died for sin, though he did that in bearing our penalty, but that he died to sin, which is the exact same thing that's said of you and I. Keep reading. As a result of our union with Christ in his death and resurrection, the old life of sin in Adam is passed for us because of Christ, and therefore we should never go back to it. Keep reading. We have been brought into newness of life, the end of which is righteousness. So put your hand on your heart and say, Father, as your child, help me to pursue righteousness. And that is the daily pursuit. Here's Galatians 2.20 one more time. Look at this. Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. Let's read it together. Let's apply it to yourself. Here we go. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me. Sin is not your master, Christian. Jesus is your master, and nothing can ever change that. Are you tempted? Yes. Is there a war with sin? Yes. But God is with us in the battle. Everybody say amen. Romans 6, 2. Look at it one more time. May it never be that we would continue in sin. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So look at your conclusion on your notes. Here's some strategies for the warfare. Let's look at verses 11 through 14 in Romans 6. Romans 6, 11. It says, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. In other words, don't present yourself to sin. Present yourself to God. And you know what happens when you present yourself to God every day? It strengthens you in your battle against sin. Verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you. Amen. For you are not under law, but under grace. So look on your notes. Our justification is a foundation for fighting sin, and so it is. Always remember, our sin is forgiven in Christ, and because of the Lord's triumph at Calvary, sin is no longer our master. Everybody say amen to that. That is so true. Number one, always remember, Christian, Jesus died for your sin. It was a specific death that he died for your sin. God's wrath is satisfied forever, taken away, and our Lord's sacrifice has done that through the work of propitiation. He removed God's wrath and put God's favor upon us. Go back to chapter 5. <coughs> Look at verse 8. Chapter 5, 8. It says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us. Here's this word agape again. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, made righteous, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Everybody say, that's me. So look at number two on your notes. There, Scripture says, you died and have risen with Christ and are no longer a slave to sin. Boy, we need to remember that every day of our lives. Look at chapter 6, verse 5. One more time, we're almost done. Verse 5 says, For if we have become united with Him, with Jesus, in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. <coughs> Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Read verse 7 with me out loud. For he who has died... 
That's every single Christian that is truly born again. And then number three on your notes. <coughs> Excuse me. You are united with Christ, or in Christ, as the Scripture would put it. God gave you the faith to believe. He gave you eyes to see the truth, who Christ is and what He has done. You are forever His. Now, some of us look back on those events when we were born again, and we say, well, yeah, wasn't that wonderful what I did? Look at 1 Corinthians 1, two verses here. But by His doing, I was probably 9, 10, 11 years old when I came to Christ. We got born again every week. But you know what? God was doing a work in me, even though the theology was very poor. By His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification, there's holiness, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, what? That's who I'm going to brag about is Jesus. Then number four on your notes, God reckons you to be righteous because you are in Christ. Here's a verse we read quite often in 2 Corinthians 5, the last verse in the chapter. It says, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, read it out loud, so that we might become... That verse needs to be real to every single one of us. So back on your notes, we're almost done. Notice so far that everything has been accomplished by God, and that's exactly right. What a privilege to belong to our Lord Jesus. So what follows is a command to us. So look at chapter 6. We're there. Look at verse 11. Now here it is. Here's the command for each one of us. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So number 5 on your notes. We just read it is another aspect of your faith. You reckon or consider this to be so. You're alive to God and dead to sin. Look to the Lord to walk in this light. You can say no to temptation because of what God has done in Christ Jesus. So this next week, if you find yourself having fallen short, maybe you do something you know you shouldn't have done, and you remind yourself, Jesus, I'm dead to sin. Help me to walk out and not do that. Everybody put your hand on your heart. Say, help me, Lord, to walk in a righteous way. And every one of us fights that battle every single day. So look on your notes again. Some simple weapons in our warfare. Prayer, the scripture, as the sword of the spirit in Ephesians 6, and walking in love with our brothers and sisters. So your homework this week, if you would please, is read and meditate on Ephesians chapter 6. Now, as we close, go to 2 Corinthians 5. You're in Romans, so go to the right to 2 Corinthians 5. And look at verse 17. This is a passage about the righteousness that God has given us in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's every Christian, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. <clears throat> now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now we're witnesses to this truth. We're God's witnesses. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. Here's the appeal. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now read verse 21 with me. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Now let me ask you a question. Does that mean sinless perfection? Nope. Go to 1 John chapter 1. Here's our last scripture I want to read. 1 John chapter 1. All the way near the end of the New Testament. 1 John 1, let's read verse 5 through 10. This is not sinless perfection. Here it is. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, the word walk there means that that characterizes our life. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Now verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Put your hand on your heart. Say, help me, Lord, to keep fighting my battle against sin. Not perfection, my friends, but definitely a godly direction. And that's true for every one of us. So let's... 